Thanks very much for downloading this episode of Folk on Foot. Before it starts, I just wanted to share a message with you because we rely entirely on our listeners to keep this show on the road. We don't take any advertising. We don't take any sponsorship. We have a generous bunch of people who give us some money every month to make sure that Folk on Foot can continue. And if you'd like to join them, you can do that at folkonfoot.com slash support us. You can become a patron and make a regular contribution, or if you don't want to do that, you can just buy us a coffee. It's as simple as that, and you can do it at folkonfoot.com slash support us. Every donation, no matter how small, makes a big difference to us. So thank you, and enjoy the walk. We're back in Bonnie, Scotland, and boy is it Bonnie today. It's a beautiful, sunny, warm day in May, and we have come from Aberdeen in the northeast of the country, and we've travelled west to the foot of a big hill. And this is where we're going to meet the Scottish Burmese singer and sound producer Fiona Sopang, who has a project which is right up our street. Good morning. Good morning, how lovely morning. to see you. Good morning, lovely to see you. I'm really glad that you've managed to come on a, a day when we've actually got a bit of sunshine. I mean, it's the 13th of May now, and literally this is the first day this year I've had my jacket off. It's absolutely <laughs> glorious this I morning, know. isn't it? As I was driving over, there was a real fog and mist coming down, and I was thinking, oh no, I want. To. I was really looking forward to showing them the amazing views. I said, there's not going to be any view, but luckily there's going to be fabulous views. Yeah, so. there is a great view. And where are we? We're at the foot of... Ben he, the, we're on the Benihi range and we're walking towards one of the tops called Mither Tap. Right, and very popular. There's very some people popular. coming down with their dog at the moment. Yeah. I want to give a sense of the colour around here as well because there's a lot of yellow gorse yeah. out around us and uh, there's some pine trees ahead and everything's just bursting into life yeah, because it's it May and the green's coming it's through. It's the folk song season, isn't it? It certainly when, is. When, yeah, when the May, yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So let's start walking up and I want to learn a little bit about your album because when I heard about your album I thought, how can we not do that on Folk on Foot? So just tell me about it. It's basically taking lots of different places that have got songs attached to them and I thought it would be a really nice idea if I could kind of make a musical map of the area and I found out so many different songs it was kind of impossible to choose which ones so I didn't pick the really well-known ones like the Bonnie Lass of Fivey because everyone knows that I I chose ones that were a bit more obscure or, or ones that people had not heard and stories that maybe didn't have a song attached to them so but I created my own updated Versions. So half of the songs are traditional yeah. songs and half of them are your compositions exactly. based on folk tales. Exactly. Maybe I've changed the melody. Sometimes I've kept the original melody. Sometimes I've made little alterations to the lyrics. And the other five are completely new songs that I've written based on local folk stories. Now, but the amazing thing that drew me even closer to the project is that every song has a walk. Every song has a walk, yes, it's amazing. I discovered, when I was recording over in a studio on the West Coast, through the engineer there, through Jamie Smith, I heard about this amazing app called Echoes, which you can create geolocated sound walks. So basically, if you have a sound file, like an MP3 or a WAV file, you can upload that sound to a digital map. And then that links to an app... And when you're walking with the app with headphones on, the audio in the app is triggered by GPS. So when you're walking past a specific spot, then the audio file will play the song. So Amazing. I just, so I just thought I've got to use that. To, I'm getting a bit breathless. Yeah. Well, let's just pause here while you're telling us. Yeah. So you've created for each song a geolocated walk. Oh, yeah. And so we could put our headphones on. Exactly. And as we get towards the spot where the song was yes. collected or where it's referring to, exactly. the song would play. Exactly, yes. Oh, fantastic. And sometimes I've designed it so it kind of gets louder as you get to the centre. Sometimes it will play on a loop. Sometimes it will just like play the once. But you can like really experience 
what the, the songwriter would have felt or the, the characters in the story being in that exact location. I wonder if we could do that with our Folk on Foot episodes. I, suppose, I presume we could. You know, We could uh, load them up to the app and, and they would be triggered yeah. when you went for a walk in the places we were walking totally, in. Totally, yes. And, and what's great about the... Um, Technologies. It's completely free as well. It doesn't cost you. So, it, is there a particular spot that we're heading for on this walk that is related to a song? Yeah, absolutely. We're headed for um, a place which is now known as Hosey's Well, which is related to the first track on my album called The Ballad of John Hosey. Let's keep climbing. Okay. I was thinking about how the landscape is totally like a part of you. I remember coming up this very little it's like steps that are worn out of the out of the granite when i was maybe seven or eight and going up this particular step here thinking it was so huge <laughs> thinking i was like climbing up like mount everest or so this is a place you've come to yeah, a lot yeah is it? every you know several times a year every time i come up here it brings me back to like being seven or eight coming in the, and it was winter time when there was water trickling down and i was thinking gosh what an adventure <laughs> <laughs> So we're coming out from amongst the trees now into a patch of heather and gorse. And again, the yellow is bright. And we can see the summit, which is a sort of flat-topped rock at the top there, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of people think it's an ex-volcano, but in fact it's not. It's just a, a funny little knobbly, knobbly bit with a flat top, which it very, looks very volcanic. The top peak is actually Oxton Craig, but it's a bit less distinguished than Mother Tap. What does Mother Tap mean? Um, mother Top. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and the sun is beating down. Oh, it's very warm. Isn't which it? is great. It's lovely. So underfoot we've got the granite, haven't we? And I know Aberdeen's called the Granite City. So uh, I take it this is a rock that we find a lot round yeah, here. Yeah, lots of everything's granite round here. But I discovered an interesting fact the other day when I was reading the little booklet produced by the Baileys of Benihy. And there's a extremely rare mineral that it is only found in a quarry just near the, the car park where we parked up called Macaulayite, which was discovered in the 70s, I think. And it was named after the Macaulay Institute of Aberdeen University, which is now the James Hutton Institute. But seemingly, there are some scientists from NASA investigating the Macaulayite because there's a theory that its reddish brown colour is what makes Mars red. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure how far they've got on their research yet, but um, yeah, that's one theory. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, and that's just, and it's so rare, it's only found here. So it's like the surface of Mars? Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, out of this world. Funnily enough, another thing that's linked to Mars from the album is the Sands of Forvey. It's just south of Newborough on the east coast. The sand dunes are so wild and bleak and barren that when you're walking out there, you could actually imagine that you were in the hills of Mars. But also a real link to Mars is that there is a, an area on Mars named the Sands of Forvey after that place. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And you have a song about that? I've, well, I've got about the sands, not about Mars. <laughs> but about a legend that links with the, the sands. What's the legend? It's a story that I remember my mum telling me when I was really small. I remember it scared me so much I had nightmares about it. She told me that if you're walking on the dunes, there's a, an ancient village that's buried beneath the, the waves. Over the years, the sand dunes encroached on the village, eventually burying it. And her story was that on a certain night you can hear the church bell of the village chiming.
And the legend goes that the storm was brought on because they were cursed by two local sisters, cheated of their inheritance by a relative who sent them out to sea in a leaky boat, but they managed to survive. And as their revenge, they brought a curse on the village. And it's an actual meteorological record that there was a nine day massive storm, which did bury the village. launched the idea for the album with a walkthrough and it just so happened that on that day there was a thick har coming in <laughs> so people were walking around with their headphones on with the app in that thick dense fog listening to recordings of church bells and everyone said that it was very unsettling and quite creepy yeah i can imagine <laughs> haunting i would imagine yeah. shell to glass glass from shell, shell to glass, glass from shell. Look at the view from here, oh my god. Oh word. my goodness, yes. Now we can see, because we're above the tree line. God, yeah. It's more than 180 degrees, isn't it? Yeah, Because it yeah. circles around so us, the plane. Be... So Aberdeen's away to our right. Yes. And that would be Case Ness up that way, and that would be the Bucking Plain of it. God, it's. You know, you can see why they built a hill fort on the top, couldn't you? Because, I mean, you can absolutely. If you were fighting a battle or trying to run away from your enemies, I mean, you can just see anything coming for hundreds of miles. Yeah, you could command the whole area, couldn't you? Yeah. So, Fiona, we're coming towards the well now. Uh -huh. Tell us about the story behind this well. Basically, it was a couple that used to come up courting just at this spot on the hill, and the man's name was John Hosey. And um, the couple had agreed to marry, but on the eve of their wedding, when they were out walking on the hill, John Hosey was called up to fight for the Earl of Mar against Donald, Lord of the Isles, at the Battle of Harlow, which turned out to be the biggest and bloodiest clan battle in Scottish history really and that was fought just at the bottom there's a monument um, quite near in Varuri of the site of the battle anyway so John Hosey goes off to fight in the battle and when he doesn't return his sweetheart and all his family presume that he's died but in fact he'd been captured by the enemy and taken marched back all the way to the west coast and taken prisoner that several years later and by this time his sweetheart Jean has met someone else and got married to another man one day Jean is out walking on this spot with her new husband meanwhile John Hosey had escaped from his prison and had walked all the way over the hills to the spot to find his love again. Right across Scotland. Right across Scotland. And uh, as Jean sees him walking towards him, thinking he's dead, she thinks she's seen a ghost. And the story goes that she dies of shock on the spot. Oh my goodness. And then John dies of grief. Oh. And there's a spot up here, which is now called Hosey's Well, which is said to be formed from John Hosey's tears. But there are many, many songs written about the battle and the fighting but there's not many about the other side so I wrote a song based on what it felt like to be left behind from the point of view of Jean. Wow that is such a story it's isn't like it? It's so Romeo emotional. And Juliet, isn't it? <laughs> yes it is and the well formed of his tears is yeah. such a beautiful image. And there are quite a few like kind of stirring militaristic songs with like drumming in it about the battle, like by, for example, the Corries. But not very many slow, more kind of emotional ballads about it. So the song that I wrote is uh, 
although it's based on the legend, the melody and the tune are completely new. Although it actually sounds quite, it sounds like a traditional tune, it is a completely new composition. As you can see, it's not really a well, it's more of a kind of dog watering hole. <laughs> there are a couple of Highland Terriers in it at the moment, but there is a, it's like a sort of spring coming out spring, of the side yeah, of the hill, which isn't is it? supposed to be Hosey's Tears, and it looks lovely and clear though. And it's flowing down a rivulet here, across the path and on down the hill. Yeah. Would you sing the song for us here? I would, I was, I'd love to sing it here. Tuck the cellar, come tuck the wine, fill the table of our desire. Ale and bannocks we'll never eat, never taste on this wedding feast. Buck for Harlow, you never came. Now here stand and I cry your name. Oh, John Hosey, come marry me. Here far the rowans grow by the side of Benny. Still our promise I vowed I'd keep. For spring sweet blooming. To seven winters deep Till another One day I wait And to the south side Bower I laid Then back for capture That day you came To her hillside You cried my name Oh, sweet genie, I'll marry thee. Here fire the rowans grow by the side of Benny. Oh, my Johnny, your head's no sayer that our true promise is no mayor. Seven days' journey. Our hell and glad to see her Jimmy here again. Oh, this day long enough, seven long years. But now with us, how sight flows, we are tears. How wonderful to hear that with your feet actually in, in John Hose's well. tears. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever sung it here before? Never, I've never sung it here before. How no. does it feel? I've been, I've been here lots of times, sitting probably quite near here, but I've, you know, it feels pretty wonderful, really, and yeah. very strange. And the daffodils just come out just at the head of the spring yeah. here. So a little flash yeah. of yellow. Yeah. Beautiful, isn't it? And it's funny the singing it though, because it, although it is a completely new tune, especially when I sing it totally unaccompanied, it feels sort of really ancient in a way. It has that spirit about yeah. it. Yeah. So it feels you're connecting yeah, back definitely. with the history I feel, of the place. I feel a, a big connection, yeah. Yeah, especially with the Scottish, the Doric dialect as well, because that's what, although I don't really speak it at all now, my mum and my gran were both very strong Doric speakers, which is a dialect just particular to the northeast of Scotland. And hearing the dialect and speaking the dialect makes a, a real connection to my, my gran as well, which is nice. And there's a board here that tells the story you told us about the heartbroken That's soldier right, yeah. and his lost love. 
And there's a poem here in the Scots language. I wonder if you might read that for us. See if I can remember my best Doric. So who's his teen he's guid claymore and kissed his blushing bride and jumping on his milk-white horse awa to Harlaw heed. For many days I've sat and grat and for as many years I'll sit and weep for my lost love until my Jean appears. 480 years have gone. At least that's what they tell. But the tears of Hosey yet spring up at the place called Hosey's Well. So you'd come up here as a kid? Oh gosh, all the time. Kind of a family tradition to come up here on Boxing Day to blow away the cobwebs, provided there's not ice, street ice underfoot, by the way. But um, yeah, we used to do that a lot. And were you a keen walker when you were a kid? Um, Because I was a somewhat reluctant walker (laughs) when I was younger. My parents used to take me, but I was a bit grumpy. Yeah, no, I've only kind of just got into walking quite recently, really. I remember finding that they trek quite a struggle when I was little, being quite scared by the bleak open space of it. I can imagine on Boxing Day, it's a bit different from today. (laughs) Yeah. And there's a weekend here on the left. Yeah. Or enough on um, Christmas time passers by decorate all those trees with little baubles and tinsel as well because there are trees that are christmas trees yeah, here yeah, aren't yeah. there in, in amongst the heather and yeah. we can see the mountain top much closer now and the path snaking up to it and the ground is spread out like a sort of relief map it's the kind of thing i used to make out of old cornflakes packets <laughs> when i was at school with the different patches of color the yellow of the rape and the green of the fields and then away into the distance there's Hills in the distance just shrouded in a little bit of cloud and mist. It's a view you must be very familiar with. Yeah. Oh, one fun thing we used to do when I used to come up here when I was young. The farm where my grandmother and great-grandparents were brought up is at a little village called Kemney, over there somewhere now. I remember coming up uh, with my cousin, and when you're at the top, you can see the farm and on a Sunday day we used to take a mirror with us and shine it to shine it at their window to say we're at the top (laughs) we'll be home soon (laughs) and they could see the reflection all the way over the yeah in the distance in the farm yeah how wonderful yeah it's completely like part of your DNA really coming up here so this is coming home yeah definitely oh definitely definitely coming home especially because it's such a iconic sort of shape and so prominent my mum was telling me about when her her mother my gran went away far far away all the way to Fraserborough to train as a nurse and she says she remembers her granny saying that when she came back when she saw Benny Hay in the distance she would start crying because that meant that she was near home <laughs> does it have the same effect on you yeah, it does it does I was thinking oh where would I like to live when I'm an old old lady and I think I'd quite like to live somewhere where I can see Benny Hay and that would really feel like I was at home. Yeah. More than anywhere else, I think. And do you think we could see Ochindoon from here? Um, I think it's a little bit far to see, but it's over in the direction to my to my left. Well, I mention it because, of course, there's a song on the album of that yeah, name telling the story of the of the castle and ve- what went a, on there. Yeah, it's a very famous song. It's been sung by loads of artists, including Steely Span and more recently Alistair Roberts. But it was based on a story about the burning down of Ochindoon Castle in the Battle of Ochindoon, which was in 1594. And the battle was all about rivalry between two clan factions. The the Macintoshes and the Gordons were aligned with each other and they were fighting against the clans Forbes and Ogilvy. And um, the Gordon clan, in alliance with the Macintoshes, they capture Ochindoon Castle. But rather than occupy it for themselves and defend it, Willie Macintosh decides to burn it down against the wishes of the Earl of Huntley. Hence in the song... Turn again, Willie Macintosh. Turn again, I bid ye. If you shall burn Ochindoon Huntley, he will heed ye, he will behead you. But Willie Macintosh decides to burn the castle down anyway. And um, you can still see the ruin today. It's a... And it's a great loss of life as well? I'm not sure in that castle, but that burning of that castle was in revenge for another castle that was burnt down at Corgarth where there was a lot of life lost a family, Margaret Campbell and her whole family and servants were 
all burned. So Some pretty bit, vicious stories yeah, vicious that you stories, tell on this album. Vicious aren't stories, there? yeah. It's all blood and guts and doom and despair. But um, funnily <laughs> you enough, you say that with some relish. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you like those kind of stories think, because they're very I visceral? Do. I think the more the more suit my, the style of my voice. I like think my, my voice, um, the tone of my voice is very low, and I think it sounds quite melancholy sometimes. And I fit my voice fits more with like sad ballads more. Maybe I should sing some more quick ones. <laughs> <laughs> will you sing Och and Doon for us? I will sing Och and Doon. As I come on by Fiddick side On a May morning I spied Willie Mackintosh And who would afford the dawn Turn again, turn again Turn again, I bid ye if you should burn Ochendun, Huntley, he will heed ye. Heed me, or hang me, that shall never fear me, for I will burn Ochendun ere the life should leave me. As I come in by Fiddick side on a May morning. Och and Doon was an a blaze, and what afore the dawn. Crowan and crowan, for I your crows a crowan. You've burnt your crop and sent your wings, and what afore the dawn. Just wonderful to hear you sing that with this extraordinary vista behind I you. I know, it's the perfect place to just, whoa, let rip. It's amazing. <laughs> We're nearly at the top and the view is absolutely spectacular, but I think we have to retrace our steps and get down to the bottom because there are other locations we need to go to, other places where your songs are located. Yeah, I'd love to take you over to the coast because there are a couple of tracks on the album that are based on stories about fisher people and one over at Pennon which I'd love to sing for you. Well that would be wonderful to go to the sea now. Having been here up in the sky we can go to the sea. (laughs) Let's head down. So Fiona, you've talked to us a lot about your Scottish ancestry, hmm. but I hear that you have Burmese yes. ancestry too. Can you yes, tell us I about have. that? Well, my father, whose name was Mung So Pine, met my mum at the Hammersmith Pally in London. And she was trained to be a nurse and he was in the Burmese Merchant Navy. And um, yeah, he died when I was four. He was lost at sea. So that's just why singing the Fisher's Lullaby is particularly poignant for that's me. That's an extraordinary thing to happen, yeah. yeah. So, do you have any memory of him? I've got a couple of little memories of one um, sitting on a tartan picnic rug on the outskirts of Aberdeen having a picnic, waiting for my mum to come from work. And um, a couple of vague memories of him carrying me on his shoulders, going to the bank, bizarrely. I don't know why that's stuck <laughs> in my head. But so those are images of, in your mind yeah, of him? Yeah, yeah. We're just going across this lovely stream. So I was only four when he was lost. So did you later in life want to look into your Burmese heritage and explore it more? Yeah, it, it definitely felt that there was a part of me that was completely unknown because growing up in the outskirts of Aberdeen, as you can imagine, there weren't many other Burmese around, like there was myself and my brother. <laughs> so uh, there was, we had no contact with the Burmese culture at all. So it was really kind of quite a big mission for me to find out more when we went to visit Burma and that's why I started looking into singing in in Burmese for my first album and that I find the language a real way into feelings and memories and through me experimenting and singing in Burmese on my first album I was in a way kind of getting in touch with that culture and I think I'm doing the same thing now with this album I'm getting in touch with my, my Scottish roots yeah. through the language. So did you go to Burma? Yeah, or Myanmar, and, um, as we should say now, I suppose. Myanmar, yeah. Myself, my brother and my mum went there in, in the mid-80s. 
And what effect did it have on you to connect back with, with a culture that you didn't know anything oh, about? Oh, that was totally, it was completely bizarre. I remember leaving when we, after our seven day visa was up, we were at the airport leaving and there was like throngs and throngs of relatives, cousins, second cousins, they'd driven, you know, come all day from the, the little farm in the countryside to meet us for half an hour who couldn't speak any English and, you know, and so all these people that we obviously were really connected to, but at the same time we didn't have any connection with them at all and we felt like really close to them but like, at the same time completely strange it was quite upsetting really and did you try to learn the language no um, i brought back a phrase book quite a lot of the lyrics from my first album i just opened random pages from the phrase book you know at the restaurant and it turned out that one of the songs that i'm singing is something like Please may I have a napkin. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the shape of the words yeah, in your mouth that you wanted yeah, to just feel. The feel. Just the feeling and, and the sound the of it. And... Yeah, just the sound of the words. And, um, and it's funny, we're singing in the Doric accent. Oh God, I so feel so connected to my gran. Sing, especially about Auchindoon, because she was a really broad Doric speaker. And when I was growing up at school, speaking Doric was totally frowned upon and discouraged. So they tried to get that yeah, out of you, yeah, as it yeah, were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's only in, in quite, quite fairly recently there's been a bit of resurgence in, in the Doric, and there's been actual competitions and festivals celebrating Doric language. And of course, my ancestor John Strachan was a. Now really... tell us about him because I'm interested in how you're related to him and who well, he was. So am I. I'm, <laughs> there's definitely there's a connection with him with my gran. My gran's maiden name was Strachan. He was a ballad singer. He was a ballad say. singer. Yeah, um, quite a well-known one. He was actually the first singer to make a recording of the famous ballad of Bonnie Lass of Fivey for Hamish Henderson. Hamish Henderson was a, a folklore collector who worked with Alan Lomax and he organised the 1951 Edinburgh People's Cayley Festival which kind of sparked off the Scottish folk revival in the 60s and John Strachan was one of the singers at that festival and he's, the reason that I started recording his work was he'd made an album which is in the Alan Lomax Portraits Collection Songs from Aberdeenshire it's a full double album of all songs from the neighbourhood. I've recorded one of his called Bonnie Adney, and Adney is a little village about um, 15 miles from where I live. But I'm still on a mission to find out exactly what the connection is. I've got a massive pen board at home with index cards and arrows and bits of string. So on the family tree? <laughs> yeah, right. trying to work out what exactly the connection is. And do you use his voice on the album? Yeah, I've sam- I very, was re- very happy to have had permission from the Alan Lomax archive to use some snippets of some samples. And I've got, on one track, I've got his actual voice singing Bonnie Adney. But the other bits, which I like even better than them singing, are the, I like the outtakes between the songs, going, oh, I messed that up, I'll start again. <laughs> And you put those on the, yeah, on the record. And, uh, That's no, um, yeah, so there's sort of snippets of him in between, yeah. So, Fiona, you brought us to the seaside. I brought you to the seaside. It's beautiful, it's beautiful yeah. isn't it? It does yeah. look... On a day like this, it is beautiful, but I tell you, in the middle of February, when it's not sunny and when the wind's blowing a gale, it's not quite as pleasant. And what's but, that settlement we can see across the beach uh, there? Just, that will be Banff over there. Just behind us is White Hills, and uh, the next one down is Banff, which is linked to Macduff. And but, why have uh, we come here? Well, this is the setting of uh, one of the songs on the album. It's based on a story about a local girl called Maggie Macklin. During lockdown, I used to come here very often with my dog to walk. And um, I found out about the story just from that tourist board that we just passed. And I think it it probably is based on a true story, but um, there's not very much evidence about it. But... um, the story is that the girl Maggie Macklin lived in the village of Boindy, which you probably passed through on the way down. And uh, she was a servant girl and she fell pregnant to the, the laird of a big house, a Boindy man, 
of high degree. And when um, he found out that she was pregnant, he cast her out of the house. And she was so distraught, she didn't know what to do. So she seemingly came down here and sat on that rock all night looking out to see... What, the rock we can just see here in the foreground? See, yeah, and um, the next day she was discovered dead. Oh, my goodness, so yes. she died of exposure? I think so, yeah. Or one, one story is that she might have committed suicide. The other story is that she died of hypothermia. What a but, terrible uh, story. Another know, terrible another story. Another terrible story. I'm full us. of them, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but um, I, kind of, I think those stories really fit with the landscape. It's like quite bleak and bleak and wild. And uh, those stories do so, tend to fit. Yeah, it's that, that little, slightly smaller one. Where it's, where it's um, conjectured that is the rock where she sat. And it's also rumoured that on certain nights she can hear her singing as well. So that would be a, quite an apt thing for the um, the sound walk. Yeah, and a good well. apt thing for us now. Would uh, you go now, and yes, sit on I'd, the rock and sing for us? On the rock? Well, I could, yeah, I could, couldn't I? Yeah. On the actual rock. I hope I don't die of cold. It's oh, not that cold. We'll make me. sure that you're well <laughs> wrapped up. And frankly, it's a beautiful sunny day. It's a bit of a breeze, but yes. I think you'll be all right. Yeah. So is it this one is here? That one there, yeah. Yeah, let's climb down the, the side of the bank. All right, we're in amongst the pebbles now. Great rock sticking up here with lichen, orange lichen all over the top. When I came here, it was May as well, and I mentioned the colours in the song: yellow and white, and green and blue. Yellow for the the gorse and this lichen, white the daisies and the dandelions also, and the bluebells for the blue and the green for all the lush grass. Because I used to come up here so often, I was really struck, in, especially in springtime, really struck by those colours. And the sea too, and today there's a bit of green in the sea and a bit of blue in the sea and a bit of grey in the sea further out, isn't there? Yeah, not so much grey today, but it can be very grey. As I walked out one May morning Dandelions and daisies Bluebell and broom yellow and white and green and blue I came upon this tale of you Maggie Machlan I came upon a rock so bear, clover and thistle, sea spray and foam. I heard of the girl who ran her despair, sat down till dawn in the deep night air. By a bondy man of highest degree.
really interested in your creative practice. So when, when you came here and you thought, I know, I'll do a song about Maggie Matlin, uh-huh. what happens after that? What, do you, do you um, make notes here? Do you go back to a uh, studio? Let me think, how did it happen? I wrote the lyrics here over a period of a few weeks and then I took the idea into my studio, which is my bedroom, on my laptop, it's very high tech. And um, I just basically mess around with, with noises until I find something I like. So with electronic noises? With, with electronic software synths in a program called Logic on a MacBook. And I also mixed it in with some recordings of the sea that I've got, that I took here. and. It's a bit like crocheting, really, <laughs> like inter- interweaving all the different elements. And, um, and then I got Alice Allen. I asked her, because it was in lockdown, none of us could meet in person. So she recorded herself. I sent her a rough track with some of the synth noises and the rough vocal. And she just improvised her cello part on top. And then I took it back into my laptop. And then I basically chopped up what she'd done drastically and she said she didn't mind what I did with it <laughs> and she'd also done several overdub tracks with the more like the sound effects of the birds and they were just mixed in as well so most of it's in your bedroom it, all of it's in my bedroom apart from the real musicians who um, I've got several local traditional players and also an experimental artist as well but they all recorded it separately in their in their uh, own bedrooms in their own bedrooms yeah, yeah amazing yeah. And, and I suppose the simplicity now that electronic technology technology is now so available to us that it's it's a much more democratic process isn't yeah it? totally i always think it's, it goes back to the old punk thing because the old punk ethos was yeah everyone can do it you don't have to have a music degree you don't have to go, like, go to have a conservatoire training to be a musician anyone who's got a guitar and who can play three chords can get up and do it and now it's exactly the same thing except it's moved the technology's moved on so anyone who's got a garage band app on their phone or anyone who's got a laptop can make records from their bedroom and it's really a democratic thing, just like what was going on in the punk days. And I should ask you about that because you were very much involved in yeah, the punk days, when not you? Yeah, you were in a band, weren't you? I was, I was an all-female band, wasn't it? I was wasn't in it? an all-female punk band. Yeah. Now, what was the name of the band? Oh gosh, that was that's so embarrassing. At one point, we had several incarnations. At one point, we were called the IUDs, right? The, <laughs> from the female contraceptive. Yes. Um, then when it went more new wave, we mutated into acapop, but we started off as a the IUDs. I'm liking the IUDs more really <laughs> somehow. And what was the style of your performance? Um, totally ramshackle, totally ramshackle. On the, our very first gig, playing away and I went, I thought, thought, thought to myself I, I can't hear the guitar, what's happened to the guitar? And Tracy, the guitar player, had ran off stage and was puking into a bucket. <laughs> That's pretty punk. <laughs> she, she was, I was thinking you should have done it on the audience, Tracy. Yeah. <laughs> so where was this? What that, stage that of was, your life was this? Um, oh gosh, I was a late starter. I, that was in my 20s. Yeah. So how do you describe yourself now? Because here we are on Folk on Foot. Do you call yourself a folk musician? No, it's, it's funny. That's so funny. I've got a really bit of a complex about that because to tell you the truth, I've not been in a folk club in my life. So there's no way... Sorry, we would. won't hold it against you. <laughs> <laughs> but do you regard yourself more as a kind of producer? Um, just sound artist, sound producer, artist, producer, musician. singer. The thing is, though, why I started off doing it all was from being in the punk band, I really wanted to sing and I'd, and my whole journey has been experimenting with different ways of being able to sing. And is today the first time that you've sung some of these songs outside your bedroom totally absolutely they are yeah although i had an album launch party i didn't sing live i just played the album along with some visuals you're breathing a fresh breath of air into these yeah, songs yeah that's what and, i think that's what i think it bringing needs bringing them into the 21st century that's which what i think, I think it is needs, amazing it could, otherwise they could just die out and um, be forgotten now listen would you like to go a little bit further down the coast because there's a place down there that's quite significant isn't there yeah, it's complete coincidence. You are deaf, that we're all definitely in the right place at the right time. There's a little fishing village called Pennon, which happens to be the main setting where they filmed Bill Forsyth's movie, Local Hero. Local Hero? Local Hero. That is in yeah. my top two <laughs> of all time. Local Hero. And they're showing it tonight. They're showing it, they're showing it tonight. In the village where in, it was made. In the village where it was made, in the village hall in oh. Pennon. With the red phone box outside. Oh, and do you think we could go there? 
Oh, I think it was. It probably might be sold out, but you never know. They but, might be able to squeeze us in. And and is there a song that you might perform down there as yeah, well? Yeah, what I'd really like to perform there is it's, it's a lullaby that would have traditionally been sung by the fishermen's wives of one of these little villages, and it was originally written by a folk singer called Zeta Sinclair, who was one of the co-founders of the. Aberdeen Folk Club in the 1960s and the song that she wrote was she's imagining it would be a lullaby that a fisherman's wife would sing to her children and as a way to soothe her children and also to calm her own fears when her husband was out at sea but I've taken her lyrics and used some of her lyrics and then added some of my own changed the melody and the version that I sing is called The Fisher's Lullaby Two treats ahead of us. The Fisher's Lullaby and then Local Hero. <laughs> Let's get going. To cheer, since to keep my hand, fair dread and fear, the far no golden slumbers, kiss your toe Smiles will seem walking you in the morn from your eyes. Hush, my pony, we bear knees. Quit Latin, will you lie? Mother's here to sing. A fisher's lullaby So far away So far away Well, you're singing that. Yeah. A really beautiful song, as you can hear right on the edge of the waves. <laughs> Thought we on were the going beach. to get wet. Yeah, and it might have been a film set. Might have... Oh, it is a film <laughs> set. <laughs> oh, funny you should mention that. <laughs> in, in this village where I feel like I've stepped into the film Local Hero. Yes, I know. It's just it's just stunning around here, isn't it? It's, so, it's... yeah, just to describe it, there's a, a huge cliff on our right here, yeah, covered in yellow gorse, and then the harbour wall stretches out, and then there are white painted and red roofed cottages uh, along the curved bay and if you've seen the film Local Hero you'll recognise it immediately and I can even see Fiona outside the hotel a red phone box. It's the red phone box. Yeah, which the makes phone box. a big appearance in the film. <laughs> what does it feel like to be here? It's amazing because it's one of my favourite. I haven't seen it for years years and years but I remember so loving it when it, when it first came out and um, it's such an iconic spot and the you know, it's, it's just beautiful. It just seems, seems to, with the light just now as well at this time of day, it just feels so magical and really surreal. I remember when we were driving down, we were coming around a, a quite a sharp curve 
and there was a cliff right in front of us that was covered in like almost fluorescent yellow gorse and it was such a surreal moment you felt like you were being swallowed in yellow I keep it's expecting amazing. that there'll be somebody on a motorbike going past really quickly because that's what happens in the film you have to watch out for the motorbike going past <laughs> <laughs> and tonight we're going to see the film yes, in the it, village hall just here just directly right behind us yeah, it's the 40th anniversary screening tonight and we were really lucky because there were only 60 places and we managed to squeeze in the last four spots and just uh, it's one of my dreams come true oh, really? so that's two of my dreams today I've heard you sing <laughs> in all these beautiful parts of Aberdeenshire and now I'm going to go inside the village hall and watch local hero with you and our team and 60 other people fine souls in there what a great day we've know, had haven't we a fantastic day it's just been so magic thank really you magical. so much for sharing your music yeah, with thank, us and sharing you your stories up. and I've so enjoyed showing you my, my hometown my home place and sharing it with you should we just go and look inside the phone box yeah does it, I wonder if it works. You could phone, open your phone. Let's see if we can phone. I'll see if we can phone my partner. I wonder if they take 10 P's or... Yeah, they might do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Bum. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed making it and if you'd like us to go on making more of these podcasts please support us by making a contribution through patreon or by buying us a coffee you can do both things at folkonfoot.com slash support us and we really appreciate any donation no matter how small we love making folk on foot and with your help we'd like to go on making it forever mm-hmm.